this week on the Back Table Podcast. The best surgeons that I've worked with are the ones that often have had some unusual complications. And the reason for that is they're so good, they're willing to take on the things that other people are afraid of. And when you are that person, you're more likely to run into complications. But the fact is, when you approach each complication as an opportunity to learn, and also, as you said, when you're open and honest about it with your patients, it, it generally has worked out okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsors. Revivirex, providing urology-specific sterile and non-sterile combining services to the specialties of urology and fertility since 2016. They currently work with over 500 urologists in 36 states, servicing over 200,000 patients live. They pride themselves on service, quality, and innovation. Products like their ICI injections are lyophilized to provide temperature stability to allow for shipping, easy of travel, and fewer incidences of priapism compared to pre-mixed formulations. Products Revive RX produces include HCG, FSH, Trimix, Trimix Gel, Libido Enhancement for Men and Women, Hormone Replacement, and over 80 unique urology-specific compounds. All pharmaceuticals produced in our facility follow federal guidelines for sourcing, compounding, and dispensing. Find them online at revivarx.com. That's R-E-V-I-V-E-R-X.com or call 888-689-2271. Orders may be faxed to 888-689-1620 or sent electronically to RevivaRx Houston. Now, back to the show. This is Jose Oche Silva, your host this week. We are happy to have a guest this week, uh, Dr. Jordan Luskin. Dr. Luskin went to Georgetown Medical School, then completed urology residency there as well. Dr. Luskin has been practicing since 2015. After finishing residency, he worked uh, for almost four years uh, in a rural setting in Colorado. Currently, he's employed by Tenet Florida Physician Services in the West Palm Beach area. Welcome to that table, Jordan. Thank you for having me. So first, I want to talk, talk about uh, how, how this uh, podcast came to be. So essentially, you, you reached out to us after you heard the Dr. Kane episode with Dr. Bagrodia. And it was a pretty good podcast, but definitely not the reality for many of us. Talk to us about, uh, about your practice, your current practice, uh, what first happened after you graduated, how you came to be uh, going to, to a small town, rural town in, in Colorado. Yeah, so um, I knew fairly early on in my uh, career that I wanted to be in private practice and also in a small community. Uh, I actually signed my contract uh, when I was still in residency as I was going to a uh, health professional shortage area in a rural community. I was able to do that. And David Keynes is someone I really admire and I'm fortunate to call him a friend. He and I think very much alike and I try to consistently think about how I can continue to improve and how I can avoid some of the negative pitfalls that um, David discussed in his podcast. But I do find that oftentimes um, many of the things that work in academia are not realistic in a private practice setting, especially not in a very small community setting. And so I think it's important to realize that you know, only 1% of practicing urologists or some small, very small number are actually in an academic setting. Most of us are practicing in the community in a private practice setting, and yet we still have the same potential pitfalls that would befall any of our academic counterparts. And we may not have necessarily the same exact mechanisms in place that were discussed that we could use, um, for example, uh, like having 
you know, other urologists available to come in and watch you as you operate. I mean, you know, if you're, um, for example, in my, uh, previous practice in Colorado, it was just myself and my partner. Uh, we were the only two urologists for a geographic catchment area larger than all of Connecticut. Now there was only 70,000 people in that region, but, uh, there was, you know, not, uh, you know, a, a full academic department's worth of uh, urologists with, you know, a, uh, a fellowship trained oncologist and a fellowship trained reconstructive urologist. It was really the two of us and uh, the cavalry wasn't coming in an emergency because we were it. And, and so tell us about your practice in Montrose. How, how far was the practice from the hospital? So the practice when I first started was originally right across the street. I could walk there. Okay. And then we moved to a slightly larger building that was, you know, about four minutes to drive. The town uh, only has two streets with stoplights on it. So it took 12 minutes every single day to get from my door to my office. Uh, there's never any traffic, never any variance. And were you guys doing surgery the same day or different days? So we had two different block days. I had Thursdays and he had Mondays or Tuesdays. I believe it was Mondays. And your partner was doing big cases already what, when you joined or? Yeah, that was one of the things that really at the time when I was looking back in 2013, was really important. You know, the Da Vinci was still not so widespread throughout the community at that point. You know, many smaller community hospitals didn't have a robot. And so when I was first looking at potential jobs and calling hospitals and speaking with um, HR personnel, you know, I was initially met with a lot of excitement about having, oh, a urologist who was trained in robotic surgery. But then when I asked, oh, well, do you have a robot? The answer was oftentimes no. And I said, well, would you get one before I came? And usually the answer was, well, we'd get one in two or three years, maybe. And I was like, well, just having finished residency, there's no way I could take a two or three year long hiatus from robotic surgery and be expected to be proficient. My former partner had joined the practice of a gentleman who started that practice about 30 years earlier. And the two of them had been doing, uh, and my par former partner was not uh, trained in robotics in residency. He and his partner would do, uh, radical retropubic prostatectomies together as a team. And he said that for many years that they'd kind of averaged about 50 to 60 a year. And then one year it dropped from 60 down to 30 and then from 30 down to 15. And then the next year it was six. And that's when they realized that patients were leaving that area and going to a town that was about 150 miles away to have robotic surgery. And so my partner went to the hospital board and said, listen, you know, we can accept that we are no longer going to offer this procedure to our community, or we can get a robot and I will learn how to do it. And so I gave him immense credit for being able to learn that technology and do so uh, not in the confines of a residency, but as a practicing urologist. And so uh, when I got there, they already had a robot and uh, my partner was already doing robotic cases. So not only, you know, was I going someplace that had a robot, but being fresh out, I did have someone that, you know, could give me a little backup on the robot if I felt like I was in over my head. So that was very nice. And, and, and that's great. I, I'll, I'll tell my story in terms of right now, I'm working in a also community area, but it's, a, it's, it's near Orlando, in the outside of Orlando. And It, it's a new hospital. My partner actually was the one that started the the robotic program. They they bought the robot. He trained with with Dr. B. Patel at that in celebration, and he started the program. and And, and it was a struggle for him. I, I still had struggles, so he decided just to stop doing cases uh, because the the me the mental aspect and the toll that he took, he, he said it's not worth it. So so it's great that your partner was able to establish that practice because. It's not easy, especially a small town uh, that most of the hospital just want to say that they have it, but really the people might not be into it. Uh, so, so when you started doing cases, uh, you felt that you have the, the, the back of you. I mean, at least your partner was somewhat near to, to help you in those cases. 
Right. You know, and so especially first starting out in um, my first year, you know, I was very careful about scheduling larger cases, robotic cases on days that I knew that my partner would be available, um, you know, never when he was out of town or, you know, when there was any chance that if something happened and then, you know, as time went on and I became more confident, um, you know, actually, as a matter of fact, when I first started initially, uh, I did book him as my assistant just to kind of feel comfortable and, you know, kind of get my feet under myself. And then as time went on, transition to doing them um, with the first assist. And for someone that, I mean, let, let's say that your partner never did or, or never had the, 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 the background, never wanted to learn, we have joined that practice still? Or, or you were looking for people that can back you in that case? I think I probably would have joined that practice still. I, I you know, had they had a robot, but that he was not, um, you know, or had they gotten me one, I think I would have. That may have been foolish of me, but I, I do think I probably would have done that. One thing that was very important to me when I was looking and ranking at residencies was, did I feel that the graduating chiefs of that program were coming out able to operate independently, or did most of those residents need to go do a fellowship to feel comfortable operating on their own? And really, when I looked at all of the chief residents that I knew graduating from Georgetown, having been a medical student there, every one of them that I knew was really um, comfortable and able to operate, you know, as soon as they finished. No, and definitely, I mean, one thing is being able to do it right there in the, in the setting that you have attendings next door. But another thing is doing the same thing without nobody, just on your own. And, and, de sure. and definitely... When I first started, uh, I wasn't robotic training in that sense, so I was doing open cases. And even though the same day that I did surgery, I had no one next, I mean, no urologist in the OR, but in the building across the, 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 the hospital, there were two other urologists who I respect very much, who I had to call them twice, one for a perk and another for a kidney, and, 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 and they were there. So definitely that, that, that was good. I don't have that here uh, right now. Because my other, my partner, he, he stopped doing the, the robotic cases. So right now we just, we said no more and we're sending it to other, to the Euro oncology guys. So, but, but that, that decision making it, or, or just st not serving a community, for example, people in, in my area that have the, the, a kidney mass, renal mass, then they need to drive 40, 45 minutes someplace else to get the treatment. But is a decision between them or, or my mental health. So I prefer just to sleep better at night. And so, yeah. And, yeah. and I will say that despite being the only two urologists uh, in that area, we didn't just do everything. My partner for many years did. And um, I remember very clearly that we had a uh, an open cystectomy that he did with a, uh, with a neobladder actually. And the case went just fine, not a problem at all. But the patient unbeknownst to us was a, um, was a pretty severe alcoholic and went into DTs post-op day one and ripped out all of his tubes. And we had, we don't have IR at all. So, you know, his kidneys started to shut down. We couldn't get him perked. Uh, you know, we also didn't have uh, the capacity for uh, in-hospital dialysis that didn't exist in our hospital. We had no uh, nephrologist. So actually he ended up getting uh, airlifted to the university. Patient did, did fine, did very well. But due to that, uh, I basically said, listen, you know, we have to recognize that while we can do things surgically, there's more to it oftentimes than just the surgical skill set. Someone I look up to immensely is um, Dr. Jeff Nix, um, who's at University of Alabama now. He was a fellow at the uh, National Cancer Institute's uh, urologic oncology branch when I was a resident there. And uh, Jeff is a great guy, and he knew that I was very much looking at a small community, and he had grown up in a small town, and he would tell me that, you know, listen, despite 
not wanting to do some of these big cases, you're going to run into these small town people who are going to say, well, if you don't do it, I'm not going to have it done. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to die then instead, rather than leave my small community. And he was right. Um, you know, there were patients who would say that sort of thing. And what I've come to appreciate over time is that patients often couch that in a sense of, I trust you so much that I want you to do the surgery regardless of the consequences. But what I've come to realize is that really, if you trust me as your physician, then you need to trust me when I say it's not right for me to do this surgery. That if I wouldn't do this to my family member, I certainly wouldn't do this to you as a patient. And if I'm recommending that you go someplace else, it's genuinely in your best interest. And you mentioned, I mean, the, the, the hospital, the, the ancillary services around you and the support that you get. What about in the OR? Were you having issues with the techs? You had the same tech all the time? Was there a, a big turnover? Because right now, for example, in where I'm at, there's a lot of turnover. And, and that's an issue because you don't, if you don't trust your team, it's going to be a, a, a very long day. Yeah. And, you know, When I was in Colorado, we had a lot of stability in the OR staff, um, and especially with our first assist um, pretty reliably being a specific person. And I do think things have changed, and I feel like much of it may be related to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, there certainly seems to be a significant staff shortage everywhere yeah. from everybody I speak to. Um, and so I do think that You know, it's, it's been very difficult for me here in this new practice where I've only been um, for just under a year to establish that same sort of, you know, team framework where it's the same group of people doing the same procedures because that's the really the way that you get proficient and, you know, efficient, especially. And how do you compare your, your, your mental state or your, I mean, do you feel more tired? <laughs> doing cases now versus four years ago? I mean, because of the, uh, of the support that you, you're having? I, I would say that truthfully I do. Uh, I feel that, you know, when I look at where, where I was and how long it would take me to do a case at the end of having been in Colorado for five years and working with the same people, you know, I, I do see the differences. Um, you know, cases do take more time. I do have to spend more time ensuring that everything's done correctly, you know, really verifying up front that all the equipment I need is available, is ready to go, is set up the way that it needs to be. And, you know, that stuff over time, I was able to uh, essentially trust that the team had it uh, down correctly. And we're not at that point yet where I am. And currently. even though now that you're more proficient at doing those procedures, because it's been more time. Do you feel like you're not doing more complex cases because of that? Or have you been just telling to some patient, hey, go someplace else, go down to Miami, goes, no? No, I, I do, um, you know, embrace more complex okay. cases. I, I do um, partial nephrectomies and, you know, really, I, I don't really, and complex reconstruction, for example. Again, I feel that I was really kind of, in a way, doing a general urology fellowship by being in a place where I was it, you know, so I learned to get my own access and do PCNL, you know, I learned to, um, you know, really do pretty much everything that I need to do. And so I've just kind of continued to do did that. Did your partner knew how to do PCNLs? I mean, he, he did his own access or? He was trained to do that originally. And then he had one of the radiologists there that would get access before I came. Um, and I initially tried that as well. Um, but, you know, I, when I trained in residency on PCNL, the way that the workflow of the case would be is that the patient would be upstairs in the IR suite. They would get access. And then actually we would do the rest of the case in the IR suite right there. And, you know, The attending from both urology and IR would be in the room reviewing the films together, looking at the, the whole picture and, you know, discussing access and where exactly to get access and so on. And that was the environment that I was used to. And so when I started, 
you know, I would go to that radiologist office and say, you know, let's look at the films and here's where I need, you know, access and why. And I just wasn't getting it, you know, um, like I remember very distinctly the case that made me decide to stop doing it that way, where I, you know, squirted some contrast through this perk tube that had been placed by this radiologist. And it was just like skiving through parenchyma, just parenchyma, like it, it was, it was a disaster. And so, you know, I had to just say to myself, well, I know the access that I want from a surgical perspective and, you know, I had been trained how to do it in residency and so felt comfortable to do that again. Okay. So, so you had some idea, I mean, it's not like you never had done the, 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 the access yourself or, you know, we're not, not in that environment. So, right. But definitely somebody that didn't have that background starting their own access could be some somewhat challenging. I, I think it's an excellent point and it's one that I personally have never shied away from um over the course of my career in private practice i now all of my prostates my robotic prostates are done in a retius sparing approach which is not something i was trained on and so that was something that i learned progressively over time likewise i did a couple a few whole eps when i was in residency but again really cemented and learned how to do it as a private practice attending, you know, I've always felt that the attendings that I'm admired the most in residency were the ones that were continually me, you know, staying up to date, learning new things. Our chairman certainly didn't train in the era of robotic surgery, but was one of the ones that recognized that the robot was the future and learned. And I always felt like if I got to the point where I was finding myself saying, well, I've done it this way for 20 years and that's good enough. You know, that's the time for me to retire. So you, you mentioned uh, the, the different approach for the uh, robotic prostatectomy. That first case, I mean, how, how was your, your preparation? How many videos you saw? What, what make you think, okay, so I'm going to do this. Why change? Let's say that your, your results are good with another approach. What were you thinking? I mean, shorter time, less less beating. What what were you looking with a better with, with that approach? Yeah, for me, um, you know, it was staying in contact with a uh, former attending at Georgetown, um, Doctor of Keith Kowalczyk, who did Jim Who's Fellowship, and you know, he was a resident there when I was um, a medical student. Then he went and did his fellowship and came back as an attending when I was a resident. And, you know, seeing his evolution, seeing him learn robotics as a resident at Georgetown and the way that they taught him, and then seeing him come back after his fellowship and the new things that he brought to the table that he'd learned. And then also watching as he evolved through the beginning of his career as an attending and how he continued to seek to refine his technique and to try and get better and better outcomes. You know, that's what really motivated me. And so what I was seeing was the improvements that were being offered by the Retzia sparing approach in terms of early continence, um, in terms of potentially some of the undiscussed complications of prostatectomy that we really don't focus on, like penile shortening and Peyronie's disease. And, you know, another thing, for example, that I added to my prostatectomy wheelhouse when I was an attending was I switched from doing urethral catheters to just placing SP tubes. So I kind of look at my career as a continual evolution. I hope that the way I'm doing things now is not the way that I'll be doing things five years from and now. And for example, in the academic setting, you have multiple attendings in, in, in ORs next door that you can definitely see what they're doing and learn from them. You don't have that. It's, it's mainly, uh, how, how do you continue talking, just phone calls, video, video conference, what, what tools, I guess, you use for learning or, or, or to, to, to evolve? One of the most useful tools for me actually has been Twitter. I use Twitter as essentially a journal club. I follow people whose opinions I really trust in each specific area, oncology, infertility, andrology, you name it. 
And, you know, people are constantly using that platform to post uh, interesting papers, links to videos. Um, you know, also when I go to conferences, also seeking out, you know, people who are doing new things and displaying their videos. So I do think that it's probably easier now to learn new things without having other doctors immediately around you, because especially comparing endoscopic and, you know, laparoscopic robotic cases, seeing the video is the same ultimately as mostly being in the room. And, and for example, when you started doing the, the, the different approach, troubleshooting, I mean, what do you do in that setting? Do you go back to your old way or? Yes. So that was the other thing was the confidence in knowing that if I got to a point where I couldn't continue to progress, I could go back to what I was comfortable with. And I, you know, and for example, I've also done, started doing way more retroperitoneal partial nephrectomy. And again, I feel that, you know, if things get out of hand, I, I do still have transparent needle to fall back on. And also what I think may be a little unique to my time of training, maybe not, uh, is I do feel like I came out at a time where I had excellent open experience in addition to laparoscopic and robotic experience. So I do feel comfortable opening if I need to, you know, I know that there has been kind of a discussion at large. Um, in the academic community of our residents getting enough open cases now. And that's kind of a funny discussion to hear. But I feel for me, you know, I did have the confidence that, hey, if I feel like I'm not progressing, I have other tools that I can fall back on to to complete the case. And what about when you're preparing yourself for, for a full OR day? It's timing an issue for you? For example, I mean, do you say yourself, I'm going to, I have to do this case in two hours, two and a half hours, if for some reason you struggle and it takes longer, does that change the rest of your day? It, it depends. You know, I think that timing in the OR is one of the hardest things to learn. Um, it's certainly not something you learn in residency, and it's something that I think you only gain with the experience of being in that particular setting. You know, I would say that I knew very well exactly how many cases and what types of cases I could fit into a full day in the OR at my old hospital. And that's different than what I can do currently at the hospital I'm at now, again, because the, you know, they're not as familiar with me. We're not quite running the same way that we had been um, in Colorado. And so, you know, I would, um, generally speaking, try to avoid just for me personally, doing more than one really large case per day. Um, you know, I found that if I limited myself to one big case, prostatectomy, partial nephrectomy, holep, and then sprinkled in other smaller cases throughout the rest of the day, you know, if that big case ran longer, it wasn't as hard to, you know, if you have, a, if you struggle with a case and then you're staring down the barrel of doing another big case right afterwards, that can be really tough mentally to shake off the first case and approach the second case with the same mindset that you would want to go into it with. And actually I have canceled a second major case for exactly that reason. And I went and spoke with the patient and I was very honest about it. And I said, listen, the case before yours was really challenging and you know, it's just been very difficult and frankly, you know, we're running late and, you know, I'm stressed and not in the right space to be doing this. And, you know, honestly, if you were a patient, I think in your surgeon came and said that you would be like, all right, I don't want you operating on yeah. me right now. Like I want you in the best possible condition to be doing my surgery. So yeah, I've, I've certainly run into that problem of, um, you know, how do you recover from a case that doesn't go well or, you know, any number of reasons. And, and you learned that on your own, I mean, or, or, or you had some mentors that you saw that they did it or how, how that happened? You know, I think the, the fundamental realization was that once I became an attending, ultimately those decisions were mine, you know, and as a resident, you don't really have that final say. Um, and you know that whatever the cases are, you're going to just be there until they're finished. And 
don't get me wrong, that's still very much how I practiced. I'm not claiming that I routinely canceled things, but I, I do think that there have been times when that was the right and appropriate decision. You know, there have been other times when cases have gone longer than anticipated. And, you know, you can just tell at the end of it, I'm okay, I'm going to keep going. And, you know, it's not a problem. But the nice thing is once you're finally out and in private practice, that decision is yours. No, definitely. And like, like you mentioned, I mean, and also if you, the team in the OR, you don't, you, don't, you don't trust them. Again, in that case, you had a bad case because and you, you always try to, to blame somebody else when, when the case doesn't go the way uh, you expect. If it's not easy, it's either the, the bad anatomy of the patient. That, that's, that's what you tend to do. So definitely if you have another big case... You know, <laughs> I don't know. I think I think I have too much imposter syndrome. Uh, whenever a case goes wrong, I'm certain. No, no, me. of course, of course. At the end of the day, it's you. <laughs> but you try to blame someone, and like you said, I mean, maybe your 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 mental state or, or that 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 afternoon, maybe the last case. Hey, I mean, you're, you're doing good. Just cancel it. it. It's probably not worth it. Struggle again, and sometimes there's there's days that you should stay sleeping. I mean, I, I may, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Things are not going your way, and 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 that happens. Sometimes you have the the. I'm not doing any big cases, but sometimes I I get I do a green light that is 140, 150 grams. It bled like there's no tomorrow, and then you do another case that it was bad also, and and it just continues, and and that negativity negativity just continues goes on throughout the day. Right. What I've found is the struggle for me now is also, I find that I struggle with ureteroscopy, not with doing the case from a technical standpoint, but the mind numbingness of sitting there for an hour, an hour and a half, you know, no matter how much I try to be ergonomic, it's not perfect. And so, you know, it just gets uncomfortable and you just want it to be done, you know, and um, I certainly know that that happens in cases yeah. like green light or, or whole ups, like when I have a nice, beautiful enucleation and the adenoma is sitting there, but it's so dense and it just doesn't want to morselate and you're chasing it all over the bladder for, you know, it feels like forever. And you're just like, I just want this to be over. Funny when I mean, you mentioned that uteroscopy, I used to do a lot of big uteroscopy for big stones. Now I'm just doing PCNLs for those. And it is a faster case, but, you know, unfortunately, the patient stays longer in the hospital, but, you know, it, it is quicker for me and, and, and I feel better. Uh, I'm not there hour and a half, yeah, almost two hours, just blasting, blasting away. Like I said, my, my, my arm gets fatigued. My, my, my butt starts being numb, just in the same, I, I stand up, I stand, I sit down again. And, and, and it's just, and, and you're doing the same thing. It's not like in a prostate, you multiple steps. You just do it the same thing over and over, uh, and and I just said, okay, right. more PCNLs, and I like to do PCNL. So I I love PCNL. It's one of my favorite cases. And um, once I um, also started adding mini PCNL to my toolkit, now my threshold of what types of stones I'll offer PCNL to has become much smaller. Um, you know, and my mini PCNLs are almost invariably outpatient and go home with a tiny little incision and some dermabond and, you know, um, so that's a really satisfying way to deal with those stones. So that's my next project. I, I need to start doing the, yeah. the, the mini perks, at least for the l lower calyx. Absolutely. They haven't bought the, 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 the instrumentation. Stores came in, they showed me everything. Let me ask you a question for the, it's only laser. I mean, only the laser fits through the, through, through that sheath. No, there actually is a, a trilogy probe that will a fit through the one. sheath oh, as well. Okay, okay. So we have the trilogy. So mm -hmm. it does not also have the pneumatic aspect. It's simply the the oh, ultrasound okay. portion only. But yes, you can you can use a probe and not just a laser. Although I find that you know with the access and the better maneuverability and all the advantages you get with mini PCNL. And especially with new, you know, we have a Moses laser and, you know, with a 365 Moses laser, you can make short work of most things. What are your indications? I know we changed the topic. What are your indicators for the mini perk? 
honestly, I've started to consider mini perks for really uh, anything around one and mm -hmm. a half centimeters um, and up. Um, you know, I feel like I can still make short work of any stone ureteroscopically that's a centimeter or less, no problem. You know, if uh, looking at your CT, the stone has a lot of really dense areas by Hounsfield units, uh, and it's in that one to one and a half range, that's when I'm going to start really looking at the density and trying to get a sense of like, is this a stone that's going to be challenging to fragment, you know, and also things like position, patient body habitus, you know, and then also, you know, I, I will be honest with patients and say, listen, you know, this, this may require a second look, you know, if it's a larger stone and, you know, it doesn't fragment well and would that be okay? Or do you want me to guarantee you that I can do this in one go? In which case we need to talk about mini perk. How many urologists are currently in your hospital? Currently we have really five that are actually doing anything. There are a couple others with privileges that okay. don't really do any cases there except for extremely rarely. And what about your re relationship with the hospital? I mean, with the hospital administration in terms of buying stuff, setting you up for, for success with, with the right personnel. How, how's that going? Th that has been more of a challenge in this setting compared to where I was. What I'm encountering, and this is the difference, the hospital that I was at was in Colorado, was privately owned, independent. And so it was very much still run by the physicians on the medical board, on the hospital board. This is a corporate hospital, and so there has been some more sense of, well, we don't want to purchase anything until you can demonstrate that you're going to be doing enough to justify the costs. But the problem is you can't demonstrate you're going to do the cases without the equipment, and it becomes this catch-22. Exactly, and that's what's happening with me with, with, the, with the perks, with the mini perk. They say, well, I can lend it once, but then what about the second one, the third one? I mean, because I'm not doing mini perks every time. I'm mainly going to do a regular perk, multiple stones in the kidney. Right. So, so yeah, it is a struggle. But but it's funny that you mentioned the stability. How's, I mean, here in Orlando, the stability is, is just a lot of turnover. Are you, are you seeing the same thing over in West Palm? We are. Yes. And, and again, I, I do think that we're unfortunately in, uh, I believe supposedly there's a, a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. And we are certainly living in interesting times. I know that when I was in medical school and we were doing epidemiology, I thought to myself, well, at least, you know, I'll never live through a pandemic. So I, I don't think any of us are prepared for what we've been dealing with now. And, you know, I do try to remind myself during these times when I'm feeling that frustration about the turnover and the staff not knowing things, you know, that they're in just a bad, as bad a situation and as overworked and as stressed out as I am. And the more I get frustrated and the more that I were to let that slip out, it doesn't make it better. It just keeps getting worse. So really, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, Dr. Keynes was talking about Uh, about how you overcome these negative scenarios with mental frameworks and how do you, you know, reframe the situation and enter into it with a positive mindset has been really helpful. Speaking of, you know, you'd asked about how do I learn new things? Twitter was helpful, but, you know, podcasts like Backtable, like Operate with Zen mm -hmm. by Phil Purazio, you know, these are really useful tools that have helped me to become a better surgeon. Definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, sometimes you, you see that you, I, I do a lot of short cases, but like I you said, sometimes I'm there, I, I could do a big, big prostate doing a green light, hour, hour and a half, two hours. I usually, it's half, half an hour, 45 minutes. And then you have eight more cases. You have until three to do uh, with, a, with a better team. Then after three, you get the other people that probably they, they don't have the maybe the 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 interest to 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 just knowledge or, or get into urology and and, and have more uh, a deep uh, in-depth knowledge of of the procedure but anyway and then it, it becomes a struggle or, or a, a run against time and then you start 
uh, telling NEC, hey, move faster, move faster. <laughs> and, and definitely it, it, it changes the mood. But like you said, I mean, I'm just taking deep breath and just sitting there and, and just, you know, whatever. I, whenever whenever I, it's over, it's over. And And I don't know if this has been your experience, but in my experience lately, you know, with the high staff turnovers, with, with people that don't have the familiarity with urology, what I have found is that those people that aren't familiar with it do really want to learn about it. And if you take the time to teach them, then the next time you run into that group, you know, on, you know, if you're talking about the late crew or the call crew or whomever, you know, they remember and they're interested and, you know, it does, it does keep getting better. So I do try to make sure to take the time to kind of at least teach them something. And, and and you're absolutely right. The problem, I mean, the one that I'm facing is that being for you in the same place and you see, you continue seeing, to see a turnover and say, well, when is it going to end the teaching? Because you teach them, they go to another hospital and then you're back right. to square back in two or three months. And, you know, it, it, it gets frustrating in that sense. But I guess, you know, it, it is the times where we're living and it's a matter of just saying, hey, it's going to be the way it is. Uh, it's not like in residency, we had the same take. The chief had been there 20, 25 years. Uh, back when I was in the hospital in Puerto Rico, again, same take. She's been there 30 years, and, and she handed me stuff without me thinking or thinking that I even needed it. She already had the instrument that I needed. And yeah, I, I remember texts in residency that I didn't realize the extent to which they were actually really making the case so yeah. much easier. You know, the techs that knew every step of the procedure and that were retracting and, you know, doing things that, you know, if you didn't think about it and didn't know that they were doing it when you got out into practice on your own, you were like, why doesn't it look like it does when I'm in, you know, when I was in residency? And then the other problem that I have, the, the good ones, then they want to do something else. They go to, to anesthesia school. I mean, or, or they, they go to some CRNA. They, they, cause they're good. So, so really I understand what they want to do something else. And then you get stuck with the ones that are just there. And, and I've found that problem, especially to be a lot more challenging in the clinic. You know, what I've found is that the best medical assistants that I've worked with are the ones that are driven to learn and to do better and to gain knowledge. And those are the ones that don't want to remain medical assistants forever. They're all going to go on to do something else. APP, something else. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, you know, the best ones to work with, you have to realize are going to be temporary because if they're good, they are going to want to continue to improve and expand their skill sets. And that's the, I mean, you're, you're also employed like me, but in pra practice, you just pay them more and they will continue to, and you train them to do like sort of an APP, but they're with you there all the time. They trust you, you trust them. And, and it is a problem in this employee system that they just leave because the, 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 the employer will say, Hey, this is what we pay for MAs. That's it. We don't pay more. Right. Well, you know, and it is funny. You did say, you know, in our first practice, in my first practice, we did run into that issue where we had excellent MAs and we kept increasing their pay. But the fact is that at a certain point, a role for a two man urology practice, I mean, we were running on very tight margins and we couldn't keep doing it year after year yeah, after year. And now, I mean, at some point you're going to get an APP, they're going to see patients under your name and you're going to get some money out of it as well. But yeah, it is a balance uh, between that, that feeling good or, or knowing that they're going to do a lot for you. Uh, just something simple as asking the patient why they're there and uh, letting you know the patient is here, he's doing better. That's it. So you go in, say, I mean, Mr. Whatever, I heard that you're good. That's it. Quick visit. And, and they, they did all the interview for you versus somebody that's just there going to get the vitals and that's it. And then you have to go in and do everything. Even if the patient is mad or, or, or still having some discomfort after the interview you did, it's been a four weeks still so, some dysuria. You, you get all of it. The, a good MA will absorb part of that. Yeah, you know, and that was another aspect of my first practice that actually I think was really valuable was that we had no RNs, we had no APPs. And so when there were issues with anything, 
those phone calls and those messages came directly to me or my partner. And I think that at first that if you're brand new and you've been in an academic setting, I don't think you truly appreciate exactly what the patients are going through because you're shielded from it. There's a layer of protection between you and the patient, between RNs, APPs, you know, and heck, you know, most of the time as a resident, you're spending all your days in the OR. You're rarely seeing those patients in follow-up. So it was very eye-opening to see what a real recovery time and recovery experience was like for all of these procedures that I took for granted. Exactly. And that's how you establish when you're going to see those patients or, or you start telling them, hey, don't worry. This, this is what you're going to expect. It's going to be normal. If you do better, then good stuff. But usually it's going to be this long. And, and, and every time you continue to evolve, how you see the patients the post-operatively. And, and that was one piece of advice that I was given. I believe my chairman said this to me when we were talking about finishing up and going into clinic and how do you know when to see patients back? And he said, you know, when you start, see them back more often than you think you should, you know, see them at a week and at two weeks and at three, like, because when you're first starting, you've got nothing but time. Your clinic is empty. And that's how you start to learn, you know, what's normal. How are things going? How are they supposed to be going? I mean, I'll tell you, it was almost shocking to me the amount of bruising and edema that I was seeing after hydrocelectomies. <laughs> you know, at first I was like, I must have done something wrong. Yeah, definitely. You know? For that, those how to see us say, hey, it's going to get worse. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> yes. Don't worry. You're going to think that I, you're going to think that, that I did something wrong. So don't worry. I'm going to see you in a month, three Absolutely. to four weeks. I don't want to see you earlier than that. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to ask you and get your perspective on that, that I think is a big struggle for many people in a private practice setting is what do you do when something goes wrong? You know, what do you do when there is a complication and how do you, how do you take that experience? You know, in residency, we have a very clear framework for that, right? We have M&M, &M, you know, we have a, you know, a very clear, here's how we work through this process and, you know, do a root, essentially a root cause analysis and we get feedback from peers and so on. And that's much more nebulous in private practice. I think I still don't have a clear answer to that. I just, right now, just texting peers, calling them, hey, I did this. I mean, from my point, I didn't, I mean, everything looked good, but this happened and getting feedback from them, uh, definitely always be honest with the patient. And honesty, I mean, not maybe not too honest, but hey, this is, I mean, I, I did this. This is what I do always. Something happened. But mainly, I, I guess, know your peers. I have friends that, that okay. have different specialties. I usually, those are the ones that I call. For example, one time I did, a, I, it was like, like two years, a year and a half, two years ago. It was the first time that I, I was doing an, an IPP, a penile implant, and I went through the urethra distally. So at that time, I didn't know what to do. I already had placed one good cylinder. I have seen in the past or, or heard or something, some comfort that sometimes you can put one cylinder. So I put a cylinder. I, I just left one. I left a Foley because it was distally and it, I did a cystoscope. I didn't saw the hole. I mean, I, 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 saw, I saw my, my mesenbaum coming out through the urethus, through the meatus. So I know there was a puncture, but I didn't suture it or anything. I just left a Foley and then took it out. I told the patient, hey. And the patient had a, a little bit of fibrosis. So I said, hey, you have fibrosis. It did happen. And then when, like uh, six months afterwards, I, I gave him time. The cylinder was good and, and it was good, but he wanted a little bit more. So then I talked to a, a, a and I actually that night I called uh, the, our reconstructive urologist from the group. And then like six months after, I went with, the, with him, with Dr. Brady, and we did the, the full implant. Uh, so I, at least I got feedback. Uh, I felt how that area of scar tissue felt was able to replace the, the cylinder, and we, we put another implant. He was the one that built, but I was there. I, I learned from that process. So, so I think that's the important part, le learning from it. If you don't have, I, you didn't have, uh, uh, I agree. If, if you don't learn anything, then that, that's, a, that's a problem and, and it's going to happen. It might happen again. 
Absolutely. Right. And, you know, I think that the old saying that the only surgeons that don't have complications are the ones that don't operate is very true. I think that the best surgeons that I've worked with are the ones that often have had some unusual complications. And the reason for that is they're so good, they're willing to take on the things that other people are afraid of. And when you are that person, you're more likely to run into complications. But the fact is, when you approach each complication as an opportunity to learn, and also, as you said, when you're open and honest about it with your patients, it, it generally has worked out okay. Yeah, uh, I remember th this, it was in, back in Puerto Rico, I did a partial nephrectomy. It was my first case in the morning. Then uh, the patient was in recovery and I, I, I always left a, a, a drainage and that drainage just continued to drip blood, blood, blood. The patient had a condition, he, he, he had a, a low platelets, but I, when I went to surgery, he had like 90. So he would continue to drop some hemoglobin, uh, started being, getting tachycarded. So the decision was, you do transfusion, hopefully it, it stops doing uh, uh, fresh flows, frozen platelets, doing, and hopefully it will stop. But I talked to the hospital and well, where I did surgery, even though it was in, in the in San Juan in the metropolitan area, they didn't have a blood bank. <sighs> so then the decision was, I mean, well, I need to take in this patient again. I told him, hey, if I go in, I might have to take out the kidney. And essentially what the patient, I, I, I called, the other urologist that was, hey, are you around just in case? Because I was scared. It's the first time I'm on my, on my own. So I took the patient in and I couldn't stop the bleeding. It was just from the serosal tissue. And, and I tried flow seal. I tried many stuff and it just continued a little bit of oozing. Nothing major. I, it wasn't like a big artery or anything like that. But still, the patient just continued tachycardic. There was no blood. So I just ended up taking the, the, the kidney out. I still talk to him. I, I've been four years in Orlando. We still text, so, you know. Good, yeah. It is what it is. Uh, it was unfortunate, but it had to be done. Yeah. And again, I, I don't know what happened. It just, yeah. But I, but I remember when I opened up that that that, that Gerota's fascia, fascia again, I, I was scared. I said, I don't know what, I, what I'm going to see. I don't know if, if what, where's the active bleeding is, but. Yeah, no, that's that's, I think, in my experience, one of the more terrifying situations is the idea of having to go back in on a redo on a, on a recent uh, partial. That's, that's the one that I personally always tell those patients exactly as you did that, you know, there's a very strong possibility that, you know, that'll be a radical if we have to do that. And I also believe that one of the best ways to approach that situation is if it yeah. were a, a trauma. Essentially, think about it as you would a penetrating injury to the kidney where, you know, you want to consider, should I try and get transmesenteric control of the hilum first? And then that way, when you go in, you know, when you open that gerotas, you're not faced with, the you know, an uncontrollable yeah. hemorrhage. Yeah, I, I didn't want to do the another incision. So, yeah, so, so that's what I did, but expecting the worst. Yeah. <laughs> So also, I mean, I, I wanted to touch base also. I mean, I, we're talking about these big cases. And sometimes, at least for me, I say, well, I can do two stones and get the same uh, reimbursement. I mean, do you think about that? I try not to. Uh, you know, uh, uh, having been in a, in a true private practice situation, you have to think about reimbursement. You know, I can't take care of patients if I can't pay my payroll and keep my lights on and, you know, pay the mortgage on the building. You know, I mean, these are important concerns and they're ones that are frankly just glossed over in residency. My perspective was that in general, I'm not as a private practice urologist doing exclusively these large cases that frankly in my hands don't reimburse appropriately, right? Where if it takes me three hours, for example, to do, uh, robotic cross detect me where some of my robotically trained colleagues and attendings would do that whole procedure in half that time or less, you know, their reimbursement for time spent is a lot more reasonable. That's not to say that it's where it needs to be. You know, we can have a separate discussion about which procedures are priced where and why, 
but y you're right. It's not something that can be ignored. But the fact of the matter, frankly, is that the most important place to focus in terms of your reimbursement is the clinic. 90% of your RVUs are probably being generated in your clinic. And if you don't understand how to bill correctly in a clinic environment, that's where you're actually getting the death of a thousand cuts with all those accidental level threes that should have been fours and those missed level five opportunities because you're doing for every one surgery, 20 clinic visits, however many. And, you know, it's easy to think about it in terms of like, oh, you know, this prostate doesn't pay me well enough for the time when really you're, you're actually losing more money probably in your clinic than anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I, I mean, as a urologist, I think that's one of the, of the beautiful things of being a urologist is just the, the versatility that other things that you can do in the office. Unfortunately, in this employed system, it's, it's difficult to, to, for example, I still do the resumes in, in the hospital. There's a lot of things that I have struggled to start establishing in the office because of the employed situation versus a private that you can do whatever you want and just buy the equipment, you start doing it. Uh, have you had a challenge with that? I have, um, and I've seen both sides of it because, again, in, in Colorado, when we wanted to do something, we just, you know, ran a pro forma ourselves and decided if we wanted to do it and just executed it. When I was a resident, if you look at my annual performance reviews and, and, and things, mostly what they said was, Jordan is very smart, but he doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> okay, okay. And so where that landed me in residency was I got uh, voluntold. I, I, I was volunteered onto the uh, resident surgery committee. And um, it was really an eye-opening experience to see how administration worked in a large academic hospital. And what I came to realize from it that has served me very well is that if you can make your goals align with the goals of the hospital or the employer, then you can get this stuff to happen. And so where I've succeeded now as an employed physician in bringing things into the clinic has been by demonstrating that, look, if we can do it this way, we can increase our profitability. We can improve the patient experience. So the patient satisfaction scores are higher and everybody can win in this circumstance, right? That we can do something where, you know, we're not sacrificing the, you know, the employer doesn't feel like they're compromising on reimbursement. As a matter of fact, they're probably doing significantly better by bringing procedures into the office. And patient satisfaction is much higher because there's not the trip to the OR. There's not all of the the things that go along with it, the the time off of work, the preoperative testing and clearance, all of the, you know, and plus with the rise of high deductible plans, you know, this is often a more affordable option for many patients as well. And then my own satisfaction of not having turn to, over. you know, deal with the paperwork and so on and turn over precisely. So when you can, when you can think of these things in terms of, well, what are my goals? What are patients' goals? What would be the employer's goals? If you can get those things aligned, then you can make that stuff work. But the, the problem becomes when you either can't make those goals align or you just can't get someone to see that your goals are aligned. Exactly. Sometimes I, I don't know. I, I, I have tried to convince them, but I mean, right now our office is, is, is going through turmoil and, and, and it's, there's, we have been having a lot of turnover. So, so it's, I, I have put a hold on that movement, uh, but hopefully in the near future, we, we I can uh, retake that and, and, and start establishing to do more stuff just because my, my part, I mean, from the patient perspective, is the reimbursed, I mean, the, the, the copay definitely is, is much less, much less uh, for them. So I'm trying to, to, to go with, with that and, and, and everybody wins. Right. Exactly. I, I think that more often than not, the things that we want to do for patient care do end up in that situation where everybody wins. I think it's the exception when something that we want to do 
for patient care ends up financially hurting us. It certainly can, but I think it's not the rule. I think it's less common. Exactly. So Jordan, uh, anything else you want to add? No, I, I just want to thank you again for having me. I've been an enormous fan of the podcast and I think that, you know, I've always hoped that we could see more representation of the private practice experience in this space and I'm very glad to have that opportunity to share. No, no, definitely. And thank you for being, I mean, for reaching out to us. Definitely. Uh, and, and hope to see you again. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from... Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Padwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.